Good evening to one and all. My name is Saurabh. I'm your host for the PGC weekly podcast session today. And I would like to start the podcast series by acknowledging and paying my respects to the Bidjigal and Gadigal peoples, the traditional custodians of the lands where each of our UNSW campuses are located, and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, elders past, present, and emerging and their communities who have shared and practiced their teachings over thousands of years. We recognize the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's ongoing leadership and contributions, including to business, education, and industry. Today, we have got Professor Jeshri Ravishankar as our guest speaker. Uh, she is with the School of Electrical Engineering and Telecommunications at UNSW Sydney. Her research interests include areas such as renewable energy integration, smart grids, microgrids, power system dynamics, modeling and control, and much more. She has extensive leadership experience in improving the experiences of the international postgraduate students, both within the school and in the faculty of engineering. She also provides leadership in terms of postgraduate admissions and curriculum and has led the development of new courses and student societies in the engineering faculty. Okay, now let's look at the topic of discussion for today, which is a pretty interesting one and a hot topic for the students as to how to better prepare yourself for the hybrid world. Also, let me just remind you that this podcast is not just about Professor Jeshri and myself, but it is for everyone who is either listening to us through Zoom and watching the recorded version of the same afterwards. We would be happy to raise any questions which come throughout the session or even after the session is over. Now, moving to the topic of discussion now, a recent article by the World Economic Forum indicated some major facts on how online learning is now becoming the new normal. It also stated that COVID-19 led to the largest boost in online learning participation. As nearly 100% of new graduates entering the job market this year completed their degree, at least partially online, traditionally candidate evaluation criteria must be re revisited. So there has been a complete revamp of how the traditional kind of learning methodologies and evaluation criteria were being set, they have completely been changed now. Online learning can offer better prepare, you know, for the new work-life normal, include, including those key soft skills and cross-functional skills. So my first question is in alignment with the same itself, uh, Professor, as to how the current or future students can be better prepared for that online learning. Yep. Thank you, Saurabh, for this wonderful question. It's very important. Uh, now, online learning became popular even before the pandemic. The idea of a typical student also started before, uh, started changing even before the COVID. For example, older students looking to obtain a postgraduate qualification want the education to be valuable and worthwhile, but it must also be flexible enough to fit in with their existing commitments and responsibilities. And with increased difficulties for international students in organizing their visas and spending a dime in their living in a foreign country, online learning was already becoming more attractive. However, COVID forced everyone to take up online learning without much preparation. Basically, Students' mindset has not changed from the traditional in-person learning to online learning, which demands self-discipline and attention span. For example, anything done online suffers from attention span because students multitask, check emails, chat with friends, and surf the web while attending the online lecture. Imagine if you are attending an in-person lecture, you need to spend time traveling to the campus, be ready in your class on time, focus on the lecture, take notes, and so on. So if you are able to put the same amount of time and focus while attending a synchronous lecture online, you will achieve more than what you would in a face-to-face -face traditional lecture because you don't have any distractions. You can post your doubts in the chat while listening to the lecture. 
Whereas, for example, in a face-to-face -face, uh, setting, you need to wait for your lecturer to stop speaking before asking questions. And sometimes you forget what the question you wanted to ask. And sometimes you may also end up not asking your doubts at all, especially in a crowded classroom. So overall, to be better prepared for online learning, students should learn to work independently, manage their time, show self-motivation, and be ready to communicate and collaborate in a virtual context. UNSW, for example, was well prepared for the pandemic shift to online through what is called the digital uplift of courses. This means over 660 courses across the university were announced with online contents, digital contents, and redesigned for a more flexible and personalized learning. This was way before the pandemic, that is 2017. I'm talking about the time of 2017. So we had all the resources already built up and these came in handy when we had to go online. So it is up to the students to make full use of these resources. Okay. I think uh, really uh, important things which you talked about here, like collaboration and independent learning and also how they can make use of the chat. Because now, as you yes. said that, you know, previously, Students have to wait for the lecturer to visit them and they are asking questions. Now they can do it on a live mode. Right. Uh, they yeah. can just send the questions and the lecturers are you know, ready to answer you. That's yeah. a very important point. And I think that is one of the key advantages of online learning. Great. Yeah. I'll just move to the next question now, which mm -hmm. is um, uh, pretty much you must be knowing that during these times, the students also faced a lot of challenges while well, there was a transition towards online learning. And some of the challenges were, first of all, it was adaptability. There were a lot of technical issues faced during the lectures. Time management was a problem. And of course, self-motivation. Online classes always help teachers to provide reading material, assignments, communication via email, live chats or messages, and delivering content by live sessions, presentations, recorded videos or lectures for the students. In spite of all these activities, still some students do not find it engaging compared to a traditional one. Students really find it difficult to communicate in person and who struggles with the understanding the concept. So basically they feel very shy uh, in communicating for the first time. And many times these students do not even approach teachers to clear their doubts. So how can the students actually tackle these challenges in a better way during COVID-19? And this question goes both to the onshore students and also the students who are offshore. Yep. Yeah, this is a, a really a big challenge. Um, however, although we say that online learning has these challenges, research shows a different thing. Research has shown that on average, students retain 25 to 60% more material in learning online compared to only eight to 10% in a face-to-face -face classroom. This is mostly due to students being able to learn faster online. For example, e-learning requires say 40 to 60% less time to learn than in a traditional classroom setting because students can learn at their own pace. You have you know, the recordings available so you can just go through at your own pace. Going back and rereading uh, or accelerating through concepts as they choose to do. I do understand that there are some challenges, however. Note that with the experience, the teachers are also providing multiple options for grasping the concepts. As I said before, UNSW has been really proactive in producing the digital contents way before the pandemic through the digital uplift. For example, an entire course is organized like a social media page, like a Facebook page with short video contents for a maximum of say 10 minutes, because we know that the attention span of students are limited. We also added online virtual reality simulations, uh, like also added something like a walkthrough of the on-site contents from the industry, industry blended videos and so on. So fantastic resources added. In fact, uh, in my own experience, I went, even went about creating a 3D game as an app for Android and iPad to learn the concepts in my course. So we are in a much better place to help students tackle these challenges and also providing increased support to our students as we go. 
For example, in my course, I have developed teamwork based assessments. So the entire team meetings run online and the students in, the, in a particular team, we made it quite small and these students are in different parts of the world and they are all online. The entire team meetings run online and we have a dedicated mentor attached to each team. So these mentors take the students through some icebreaker activities, ensure that everyone talks and communicates, break the shyness in the students, share the work in the team, set weekly milestones and so on. So these are very small teams of just five students who then go about getting to know each other very well. They then get comfortable and ask all their queries to the course mentors quite easily without any shy of communicating. In fact, last year, I had about 23% of the students in my course who are taking, this is the very first course in UNSW. So my course was the very first course for them. They are all new students admitted and sitting in overseas in their country. And they are doing this from their country without having a feel for the campus life. So all these students do not know anybody in UNSW. So obviously they feel so shy and they don't know who to talk to. And this teamwork enabled them to connect with each other. So it was so rewarding for these students as they discuss the teamwork task, they also discuss other challenges in their studies. For example, how to go about choosing other courses and they become great first friends in UNSW. You'll be surprised to know that the course satisfaction was maintained equal or in some of the courses we did, the satisfaction was higher compared to the 2019 face-to-face -face offering of the same course. So on your question on tackling challenges, students should actually consider the course resources as fantastic assets and become motivated to learn online. Um, I would actually recommend students to consider some do's and don'ts in the online learning. For example, first one, take time to review all the resources available in the particular course. Don't read the material just all at once because it's not going to work. Multiple reading, line by line reading are among the keys to understand the concepts properly. Spend some time just navigating your way through the course platforms and make sure you can figure out what the assessment tasks are. At least read through the course outline fully. I know many students do not do that. And don't expect too much too, too, too soon. Study, then restudy. Of course, don't procrastinate too much as well because you know you have only 10 weeks. For example, in Union our term is only 10 weeks. Manage your time. Time management skills are critical in an online course. So set designated blocks of time to work. This will help you stay up with the assignments and also with the interaction required to complete the assignment. And don't stick to your laptop all the time. Download or print out pages for reference and review away from the computer because sometimes you get so sick always sitting in the laptop. And set priorities and pay close attention to what your course convener says. Try hard to solve problems independently first before you ask for help. That way you learn better. Be patient. Please do not expect instantaneous responses to your queries. Learn how to set breakpoints in your study so that you can return exactly to the same point when your question is answered. After all, teachers are humans too. You should note that. They are not just teaching your course. They have so many other responsibilities at work and they have a family too. So be patient with yourself, with the teacher and also be patient with yourself. Give the material a chance to soak in. Because you can't just, uh, before the exam, you can't just simply sit and prepare all together. So most importantly, don't give up. Try and try and try. Have, have, have a timetable, have a scheduled focus. And I think you will come out of all these challenges. And the teachers, the lecturers, and the course staff are there to always support you. You should keep that in mind. Really yeah. wonderful how you have put forward these points, uh, Professor. I just got stuck with your initial point when you were talking about the 3D game, that you yeah. in fact took that extra charge to learn that 3D game. And I think a lot of uh, students and even professors might have done that, you know, going out of their comfort zone, learning something new online in this environment when you see everybody else is learning something new every day uh, yeah. and making use of those online resources. And also the way you have put forward those do's and don'ts, I totally agree with the fact that 
a time management skills are really important because it really worked for me when i uh, mm. this environment came into picture and also the fact that uh, listening to the course conveners is really important if you want to gain a higher grade in any subject um and if you listen to your course conveners regularly i'm sure that students can get a good grade in whatever subjects no matter whatever subjects they are studying at the university now yeah. one guess, one thing is you, you the student should not mistake that you know listening to the course convener because and then they get more marks because this course convener or the lecturer thinks you are listening it's not that when you listen to your course convener it means that you are able to follow the course much more properly and you are able to do your exams or assessments quite well so that's the yeah. meaning yeah obviously yeah because yeah. some people or some students might misinterpret and say that we were, yeah. we are listening it to just show to the professor that we are listening to him or her yeah. to gain more marks it's not that yeah. it's listening and in fact following every instruction and implementing it so if a professor tells you that you know read this case study or yeah. complete this assignment so actually you have to complete the assignment before the next lecture or tutorial so that you are better prepared for that online learning because uh, i have experienced it myself professor that you know for one, if one of the tutorials i'm not that pre well prepared with that case study so it's very less engaging for me as well but the yeah. tutorials in which i'm fully prepared i have read all the case readings uh, i am all ready to go all guns blowing because i know my case in hand i know each and every fact and now i can discuss it with other students so i think i see that difference what you are saying here um also uh now i want to move to the next question which is regarding academic integrity yes. so we all understand the importance of academic uh, integrity to make sure that whatever assignments we submit are original and they are based on the application of our ideas and referred from the academic journals on the basis of whatever we have learned throughout the course how do you think that the students can manage their online assessments with academic integrity in a better way while studying online again this question is both for offshore students and onshore students yeah online exams makes it quite challenging uh, with academic integrity um so students think that you know like discussing is not a big issue because nobody is going to see us so first students should understand what is academic integrity so academic integrity is the act of honesty trust fairness respect and responsibility all australian higher education students are expected to uphold the academic integrity during their studies whatever mode they are doing an important way of upholding your academic integrity is by contacting your lecturers or your school if you are having study problems and working with them on the solutions studying and learning provides the knowledge expected of a graduate from an employment point of view but any form of cheating means that you could miss important professional knowledge and practice that you need to succeed in your future you may just get marks and your marks are not going to fetch you a job it is the knowledge that you acquire that's going to fetch you the job so never think of cheating or copying or you know anything you don't breach that actions that undermine the academic integrity of your course or institution could affect your reputation in the future for example if you are caught cheating during your studies or in your assessments professional bodies may uh, withdraw the accreditation given to you that is a big problem additionally a range of student behaviors can undermine academic integrity sometimes students mistakenly believe that these behaviors are common place and they don't have any consequences some examples uh, for um, we are for example collaborating with your friends in the exam that's what i said you know you think that it's okay to just you know talk to somebody nobody is going to see you uploading your even uploading your assignment in any server outside the university because sometimes some of the servers if you want to get some answer they will ask you you upload some material first and then you get an answer in turn right so students may upload their own assignment thinking that they may get an a different answer or they want a different uh, material from from the server which they can take but then if you do that that is also a big problem why there are many companies out there that would sell your work or your, that is your assignment to others without your knowledge you are then indirectly participating in contract cheating so therefore this is wrong 
so you should be very careful um if you do, if you are involved in some sort of an academic integrity there could be substantial penalties for breaching these it is often thought that students uh, rarely get caught yet research shows that teachers and institutions can detect breaches of academic integrity and students doing the wrong thing do get caught and in our courses we can easily somehow find there could be some sort of a similarity every exams after every exam every school assesses what are the issues the uh, who are the students that are caught in that and you know it's it's uh, easily found out and you know you are getting experience with online learning but by designing the online assessments we are also taking more and more experience and we are finding new ways of catching cheating and th these ways are constantly improving as well so that means there is every chance that you will get caught note that in unsw as i said every school is required to submit a list of students involved in the academic integrity breach in our courses which means even any slightest breach you are involved with will be recorded so that means your name is in that record and penalties for breaching the academic integrity could include failing the assessment task or the entire course you may be expelled from the university which may impact everything you know even your student visa if you are an international student you may not get employed you may also face criminal charges so you should be very very careful in addition to the risk of the penalties being found to have breach academic integrity can impact your relationship with other students in the university your family and friends and it may impact your future career and cause you to suffer financial loss and as i said even you may lose your student visa so the best way to go forward whenever you have issues is to contact your course convener be sincere in explaining your situation and who knows you may end up getting an extended deadline to submit your work it's always much better because then you put your own efforts your knowledge you are take it as a reflection of your own knowledge and because this knowledge is very very important when you go out into the employment there so don't think if you just cheat here in the exams or in assessments when you go for a job interview you will not know what to answer so it's going to somehow impact you in your life so you have to always remember that yeah wonderfully wonderfully answered professor jashree on this part and i can't agree more on you more with you on this thing that how important is this simple thing that plagiarism is not only important for uh, you know the external environment because we feel oh if i commit a mistake then i might make my parents angry or i might make my professor angry i think it's finally up to you a professor might tell you something a uh, father or mother might tell you something but at the end of it it's your life right yeah. so after four years when you graduate out of that degree if you don't know the knowledge if you don't know how to apply that knowledge then you will be the one who will be struggling the professor is already teaching the course and you will continue teaching your yeah. parents they already have a job they are working it's now up to you that how you want to frame your life ahead do you want to have a have a life where you don't want don't know how to apply the knowledge which you have learned or you want to really understand how to apply that knowledge right yeah so uh, you should always remember the word karma so whatever you do that karma will act on that yeah yeah okay now we come to the second last question for today which is kind of an interesting one i i think it is the most popular question as far as i know because i talk to a lot of students and this is the most important question uh, so some of the students at unsw sydney are still studying from their home countries and it's not that hunky dory situation for the students who are in sydney as well because we have not seen a complete transition towards face to face learning and a lot of events across industries are still happening in a hybrid mode especially now with a new variant of virus spreading across uh, melbourne though we know from yesterday's news that nsw has now allowed the international students to come to new south wales in some pilot projects but that is something which you know still needs some sort of government approvals however the students who have either graduated recently or are graduating in the coming terms are equally worried about how to get the best out of their university life by networking with as many people as possible through linkedin or some online club activities or society activities 
So how do you really think that the professors can keep in touch with the industry uh, on a regular basis? What will be your some of your tips uh, to the students as well so that you know they can enhance their networking skills and improve their chances of getting a job in their desired sector? So it's kind of a question both for from a professor's point of view as well as a student's point of view as to how they can increase their prospects of getting a better job. Yep. So, yeah, this is uh, the most important question, as you said, because everyone wants to get something out of the degree and the one thing they want is a good employment, right? So students should first understand something. The world job market is constantly changing. Universities are also in the market of preparing the students for jobs that don't even exist yet. So we are always thinking of future, you know, what's the coming up, you know, like, for example, in electrical engineering, we uh, started a new quantum engineering program, undergraduate program, which, you know, the jobs, you know, once these students, you know, this is just starting this year. So after four years, when the students, you know, pass out with an undergraduate degree in quantum engineering, we know that there will be too many jobs out there. So we, we can predict what is coming in the job market. And we are trying to always enhance and, you know, like um, get inputs from the industry. That's how we connect with industry and then make sure that students are always prepared to take up the new jobs that may come out in the near future. So even after graduating, for example, for students from a first degree, there is an increasing need and pressure for the students to keep learning and adapting. As you said, networking becomes more critical then. Given that the face-to-face -face -face meetings are no longer possible, there are plenty of opportunities to connect via the professional sites, as you said, like LinkedIn. And these, in fact, make your connection much wider in the online space. Um, the teachers, the course conveners are trying their best to include industry networking into their courses as well. And especially with this pandemic and online shift in the courses, we are taking more and more efforts to bring in industry into the courses. From my personal experience, I can just give you an example. I ran a course where I have included industry on-site virtual reality, as I described before, that has a 360 degree walkthrough of the industry site. And many hotspots I have added in that site where the industry experts are talking about the processes in their site. So this gives a fantastic exposure to the students on real life examples related to the course concepts. They get to know the industry quite well so that when they go for a job interview in that industry, they at least know the processes. They have seen something. Even if it's a face-to-face -face class, imagine I, this is a course of 200 plus students. So even if it is a face-to-face -face offering of the course, I can't take all 200 students to the industry. It's, it's going to be very hard for me to accommodate all the 200 students and take them to the um, industry visit. So therefore, this virtual reality is really helping them to get to know more about the industry. I then invite the industry experts and also some of our alumni students working in the related industry to assess the teamwork task of the students, which uh, they do. And then these uh, industry experts offer a direct feedback to them based on the teamwork task and thus they connect with each other quite well. So industry also benefits with you know, knowing good students uh, for any future internship or employment opportunities and students also get to contact with the industry people so they then they know they it's not only the feedback about the teamwork task but then their students ask lots of questions about the industry and what are the job prospects when are they opening up any job uh, graduate positions and industry also makes use of this opportunity to invite students to apply for jobs when they want some so we are also helping the student societies to run online industry events, uh, which is quite useful for employment opportunities. So last year, um, we in fact supported students, you know, with some, uh, you know, per hour claims for them, you know, like we, about 50 hours per school in, I'm talking about the engineering faculty. So where students organize the industry event online with about, you know, 12 industry people coming online and talking to students through Zoom. Um, and then students are logging in and asking questions. So we, in fact, paid the students to organize such an event through their society. So that's, again, a very good opportunity where students can make use of those opportunities, get connected with industry people. And last year, we also did a video recording of a recruitment advice 
by one of the popular companies in electrical engineering. So we co invited them and they, they did a recording of the recruitment advice, you know, taking the students through the process of recruitment, what are the skills the industry is expecting of them apart from the technical skills and everything, all that. And we had a small panel of students as well, you know, talking to them. So it's just like we are doing a Q&A session. We had the panel of students asking questions and then we recorded it and shared it to the entire lot of students. So these are some of the things, you know, you should look for constantly all the available tools. Um, and with the online tools, this has paved the way to create such resources, which were not available pre-pandemic. So you should imagine that pre-pandemic, everything face-to-face, -face, if you're able to go, you go, otherwise you miss out, right? We can only see the photos, they are not recorded. Whereas with the online tools, we are recording each and every event, and then these resources are always available. So it's up to you to make use of these resources smartly in order to improve your network. Yeah, yeah. I think a very important thing you have touched upon here is uh, how well you can network, how you can engage with those events. Uh, and I always keep on telling a lot of students and also I think uh, a lot of experts also keep on telling that uh, it's not only about that you go and meet the person to get out, get something out of him. It might just be a casual meeting, but then maintaining that follow-up relationship, a quality relationship with that person really enhances your network. So yep. some people just connect on LinkedIn to increase their number of connections, <laughs> yeah. but it might not be correct to do that. And it might not you know, benefit them unless and until you regularly follow up with a person and, you know, keep on asking, how are you doing? Or, you know, different kind of questions, or we can just have a catch up in the city. We can have a meetup in the city to discuss about some new ideas, or maybe uh, I can know some new projects of what you are working on. So something like this enhances your network really well. Um, one last question that I want to ask you is, so we have discussed about a lot of things during the session. But do you find that if there are any two to three strong key takeaways which the students can take from this topic, uh, which is this topic of uh, how to better prepare yourself for the hybrid world? Because we have discussed a lot of things, but if you have to list down two to three things for the students, okay, sure. down, what will they be? So uh, because we, uh, we, 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 we did talk a lot about online learning, but we generally say that the hybrid learning strategy is the way of the future, okay? So when we talk about hybrid model of education, um, there are different definitions. It could be, for example, some students uh, doing the course remotely at the simultaneously, some students doing it face-to-face -face, uh, in the same course, which may not really work out as managing the same type of assessments become an issue. So uh, the other type, which normally I think would be the part of future is some elements of the course can be remote and some face to face. So which is what I think many universities will go ahead. For example, remote learning um, offered us a number of opportunities like self-paced lessons, asynchronous resources, wider networking from industry. Like I said, these can be retained uh, as well in the remote, whereas um, synchronous lectures, uh, for example, face-to-face -face lectures, tutorial, and engineering especially, we need lots of practical exposure. So these hands-on labs could be made in person. So that would be the hybrid model that I'm thinking of. Most universities will go ahead. So in essence, you need to, uh, um, there will be always some parts of learning that has to be done online or remotely. So that is, that is the essence of the hybrid model. So at least some parts of the learning would always become remote because people are now so experienced and they have found out some of the hidden surprises coming from this online delivery. And it's it's good both for students and for course conveners. So um, when you ask two to three uh, takeaways, in fact, I would like to give you say some five points, which I call it five P's, okay? Everything five P's. So the first P is participate. So in the online environment, it's not enough to show up. You need to hear, we, we would like to hear your voice and also feel your presence. So we especially need your shared learning and the sense of community in the classroom. So it's always good you participate. I know many students switch off the videos, they don't even talk, they have a chat function. Of course, if there are internet issues, that's understandable, but at least a few students showing their face would be encouraging not only for yourself to see other students, but also for us, imagine we cannot just talk, it, talk through a computer screen. 
to teach something. We need your faces as well. So participate. Now, the second one is pose a question. So share your tips, helps, and questions now and then. For many of us, taking online co course is a new frontier. So there are no dumb questions. Uh, you should not think that your question may be a dumb question. So there are no dumb questions at, at all. And even if you think your uh, the solution for your own question is obvious, please share it. Someone in the class will always appreciate that. So there is some voice there. And the third P, I would say, is persistent. Remember that we are all working in a fairly new environment. So if you run into any difficulties, don't wait. Send a note immediately to the lecturer or any course staff. And most problems are easily solved. But we need to hear from you before we can help you, right? So we don't, we don't understand what's happening at your end. So you need to ask. Then only we can solve. So no harm in sending a reminder, even if it is not answered. So always be persistent in asking questions. The fourth one I would say, say is being polite. So polite. So for example, you want to say something because you get frustrated about the course. You know, it could be a problem at your end, but you know, with that frustration, sometimes you wanted to blame it all on the lecturer. Oh, this is not correct. I mean, this assessment is so hard, whatever. So whenever you send something, because in online, it's all written in forums and everything. So whenever you wanted to send something, you have to think a little bit, slow down. How will the person on the other end read the words that you're writing? So you can't, of course, anticipate all the reactions, but do read over what you have written before you push that send button. Okay, so that is politeness. And of course, the last one, most important, we already discussed is plagiarism. Always remember that cheating and other violations of ethical student behavior are serious actions in a learning community, whether it is an online or a face-to-face -face learning. So these are the five P's I would like you to take away from this talk. Thank I you. don't think I don't think there can be a better way to summarize uh, the way you have described these five P concepts. I think this will benefit a lot of students if they apply it in the right manner while studying online. And also, I think another key takeaway for me personally was the uh, concept of time management skills and how well you can network in those events to get those job opportunities. So I'm sure that this session will benefit a lot of students who are going, who are going to watch this session afterwards. And uh, with this, we essentially come to an end to our fourth PGC weekly podcast. And we would like to thank Professor Jashri Ravi Shankar for taking her valuable time to join us for this podcast. And also for everyone who are joining us today through Zoom or listening to the recorded version of the same afterwards. We really hope to see you at the same time in the next week with a new topic and a new speaker with more insightful discussion coming ahead. But till then, it's goodbye from my side and have a good night, everyone. Goodbye, everyone, and take care. Be safe.